Okay. Thank you so much. First of all, uh, everybody, Dr. Bang, particularly for inviting me here. Uh, the opportunity to speak to a cardiology audience about this is very, you know, special because we all endocrinology, cardiology are dealing with the same syndrome. We are dealing with metabolic syndrome, cardio metabolic health. When we say the word metabolic, the master metabolic hormone happens to be insulin. And if I have in one line, if I have to summarize what probably ties together the metabolic points, which Dr. Rao just showed in his study, it's all about insulin resistance. And Dr. Bang uh, and I spoke before this presentation that how shall we go about conveying to all of you, what are some simple proofs that lifestyle change can actually work? And if some of this stays in your mind, when you see your patients, uh, going forward, small points to get more confident to work with your clients or patients on lifestyle change, uh, knowing that there is such strong evidence and such powerful small things that we can actually do uh, to help our patients save their own lives. So with that, I'll start. Okay. So very quickly, uh, I know we are limited on time and I will try to stick to some time schedule here. Uh, I, I suppose everybody knows here that I am a uh, endocrinologist after completing my MBBS in Mumbai. I completed my higher studies in Chicago. And after finishing private practice there for a couple of years, we came back and I've been in Mumbai since 2011. Um, Aside from my professional qualifications, I'm a very curious learner, and I think what has made me the lifestyle endocrinologist that I am today is because of deep curiosity in these subjects. Uh, I became a diabetes educator. I got trained in mindful eating, which is emotional eating, overeating, binge eating, um, the relationship between me and my food. I became a personal trainer because doctors don't know anything about exercise. Uh, nor do we know anything about nutrition, very honestly. It's not part of our MBBS curriculum. And uh, I learned uh, about emotional freedom technique, just again, a self-help tool to help people manage stress. Uh, I got trained in motivational interviewing, which is a behavior counseling coaching style that helps the patient decide for themselves what they want to do rather than the traditional model, which is the doctor tells the patient what to do. It's more of the doctor takes the role of a guide and gives maybe a menu of educated options so that the patient gets to be in charge of their own life and their own choices. And science has shown that this works actually for all kinds of addictions, and it is now coming into mainstream medicine to help people make healthy behavior change. And spirituality is a big backbone of my approach to life and to healthcare. So how strong is the evidence? We doctors love to practice evidence-based medicine. So is there any evidence that making lifestyle change for cardiac health will actually help? Let's look at it. So I tried to go into the cardiology literature today instead of where I normally uh, stay on the endocrine side. Of course, we all have to cross read with internal medicine mindset, but still I wanted to go into cardiology literature and the 2019 AHA guidelines talking about primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. This is their chart on exercise and they have a level one class of recommendation for the, for that we should talk about exercise but even talking about exercise is not backed up by evidence okay and there is a level one recommendation about a particular diet but it doesn't have the highest level of evidence so there is actually a paucity this is in the 2019 guideline itself where they say clearly there is a paucity of large-scale prospective randomized trials with rct design focusing on hard cardiac outcomes Okay, so when we make recommendations, we need to know the difference between am I making recommendations or am I stating evidence? It's very important to know the difference. They're not the same. So why should I do it then? I mean, why should I make lifestyle change advice and spend time in my busy OPD talking about things which may not even be saving my life of my patient? So let's look at some studies on that. This is Journal of American College of Cardiology influence of lifestyle change on incident cardiovascular disease and death. They looked at the hardest outcomes possible, CVD incidents means new events or CVD mortality. And you can see this downward slope in the hazard ratios 
as you put in more and more low risk lifestyle factors, the more number of healthy lifestyle factors you have, the CVD incidence and CVD mortality starts to drop. So this was a large study funded at, uh, by the government of US and it was done at Harvard, 11,000 patients with type two diabetes. And we say type two diabetes patients have the highest risk, correct? We say it's almost a cardiac disease equivalent, right? So this many people who were CVD disease free at the beginning showed that there was substantially lower risk of CVD incidence and mortality after making lifestyle change. And as Dr. Rao showed you the combinations of metabolic uh, imbalances, this paper looks at combinations of three or more lifestyle changes, literally bringing the CVD mortality down. So this was actually very reassuring that it is actually worth it to help our patients make the lifestyle change. It's life-saving. So now let's get specific. And uh, of course, talking about nutrition to save your life could be a, a whole day conference, right? So let's be brief, healthy oils and the Mediterranean diet. This was a beautiful study in the New England Journal again, 2018, June, it's called the PREDIMED trial. And it was uh, looking at primary prevention of cardiac disease. So that means they've never had any cardiac issues ever before. And the Mediterranean diet was to supplement them with olive oil and nuts. And the looking at, you can see here, the graphs literally drop. When you give them the olive oil and the nuts, the con compared to control, you have a lower incidence of cardiac events and lower mortality of cardiac events. So there were lower hazard ratios compared to the low fat group. Obviously, when you're giving more nuts and oil, those end up being much more fat intake. And that's actually uh, something which has been proposed a lot by a cardiologist in the UK, Dr. Asim Malhotra. He's written a book about it. This is his book about the Mediterranean diet being the heart healthy diet. And the uh, food pattern in the Mediterranean diet is olive oil as the primary fat. In that particular study, they were adding four tablespoons of olive oil per day, and they were having about 30 grams of nuts, like a handful of nuts. They had a combination of walnuts and hazelnuts and uh, some other nuts, but a mix which was given to them to eat every day. And uh, they were allowed to eat without any calorie restriction. Naturally, when you take more fat, you don't feel so hungry. So they were naturally managing their food intake. There was no diet or calorie counting. Um, fish for fatty fish was allowed and eggs or dairy was either daily or a couple times a week. Lots of vegetables and unprocessed carbohydrates. So I'll come to what is unprocessed carbohydrates and some low carb fruits like berries. What about saturated fat? So this is a major controversy which uh, started back in the 1960s uh, in the United States and the whole world has been following something that started back then in the 60s and 70s. And this whole idea of asking the public to switch polyunsaturated fatty acids for saturated fat. So we were told that the world was told saturated fat causes heart disease and you need to switch to PUFA oils and vegetable oils or refined oils. And actually 50 years later, we are all sort of, anybody who's in the metabolic world is regretting that we followed that advice. And the reason we think so is that it has been shown to derange the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Uh, it causes the inflammation, it drives the insulin resistance and uh, whereas when you start to re repair from that, you, you would be moving to the high fat Mediterranean uh, diet and the exercise to reduce the inflammation that's happening, which is the trigger for the plaque rupture. So what about PUFAs? Because we still in India are still very much being bombarded with the advertising for, uh, so to say, heart friendly oils. So what is there in the evidence? This is British Medical Journal 2013 using dietary linoleic acid. Linoleic acid is in most of your refined seed oils. Uh, it is rich in omega-6. It is the most common omega-6. And this was a study done for secondary prevention of coronary disease. That let's take this high-risk group. And now this was done, uh, this study uh, was a group of people in the 60s and 70s, exactly when this whole change of thinking was coming that maybe we should reduce saturated fat. So this study was done where they replaced, the intervention was to replace dietary fat with omega-6 linoleic acid. You'll recognize this, safflower oil and uh, the PUFA safflower oils were given as the primary fat. And this data had to be actually, uh, so there was missing data, which even though the study was done in 1973, this has now come in the public eye in 2013. And it literally said that 
substitution where you took away saturated and moved into linoleic increased the rates of death from all causes coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease so we need to question the worldwide dietary advice to make this substitution another study that got buried during that time was the minnesota coronary experiment although it was completed in 1973 it came in the british, british medical journal in 2016 and again this is what we call the diet heart hypothesis that a diet rich in saturated fat causes heart disease that was the hypothesis made in the 60s and 70s and actually this paradigm has never been causally demonstrated in rcts in the last 50 years okay but the person who proposed this idea was a very persuasive uh, uh, proponent of it and sell keys there's a lot of uh, literature now coming up about the whole controversy back then but this change did not translate to survival so this is a paper science paper from the one of the indian journals of biochemistry looking at the oils because we in india we love our oils we love our tarka or our tempering of the spices and uh, making the seeds pop and uh, frying things so this was looking at the oils which have been recommended the pufa or the vegetable seed oils and looking at what happens when you heat them up because we know now the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 is important and what they found was coconut oil was stable ghee and butter were stable and this was their chart showing you i added over here myself about olive oil since we keep on talking about olive oil it's good to put them on one chart is the profile of saturated fat versus mufa versus pufa you can see olive oil seems to be doing well because it's high in mufa and coconut oil and ghee are doing well because they seem to be high in the saturated fat the logic now is if you have polyunsaturated you have all these open spaces which can be reactive which can bind with other molecules and create these chemical reactions in the body so these were this was the experiment done in the scientific journals in india so then what about keto this was a publication done by a cardiologist dr eric westman he's a proponent of low carb and keto diets and he compared it to low fat diets and they looked at with nmr nuclear nuclear magnetic uh, magnetic resonance looking at the ldl and the lipoprotein particle sizes to look for atherogenic particles so they made two groups one group got the ketogenic diet where they were given fish porridge which is a mediterranean plant it's a flower which seems to have some health benefits in the mediterranean region flaxseed oil obviously for its omega-3 benefits and the other group got low fat, low calorie, which is what everybody was always telling the patient to take. The population was the high risk one. BMI was 34. The study went on for six months. And guess what? The ketogenic group, better improvements in VLDL, LDL, particle size, and HDL particle size. So ketogenic was superior. And the idea here is that it moved the lipid profile from small, dense LDL to large buoyant LDL. So again, making the LDL profile less atherogenic. What about sugar? Uh, everybody here needs to know that sugar is not healthy. There is no kind of sugar which is healthy. Uh, we eat it for pleasure and pleasure alone. And it's up to us to find how much sugar is what we can manage as a balance between pleasure and health. I say this all the time in my practice every day. and. If you want to bring your cardiac risk down, bring your sugar intake down. That doesn't mean stopping the sugar in your chai. It's not only that, okay? But I'll come to what are other sources of sugar, but why to do this from a cardiology point of view? This is the poor man's NMR study. It's very expensive, as Dr. Rao mentioned, to do APOB testing and to look at the uh, NMR profiles of, of lipids for looking at this. The poor man's way of doing it is do a triglyceride by HDL ratio. If you have double triglycerides than hdl you're more likely to have small dense ldl the atherogenic profile ideally you want your triglycerides to be less than the hdl that would be the best situation where the ratio is less than one triglycerides are less than hdl you have a less atherogenic profile in that case hidden sugars we need to as doctors we need to know how to read labels imagine that they will say there's no added sugar but they will say evaporated cane juice we should have some consciousness when we're reading labels like this that if a processed food manufacturer is allowed to say evaporated cane juice, don't we know that means sugar? 
right? So there are too many ways that the manufacturing industry gets away with stuff and it becomes the doctor's job to educate, but that's what we do. We're here for our patients, right? So we talked a lot about fats. We talked about carbs. Now let's look head to head, low carb versus low fat. Again, some studies. This was a RCT in lipids, carbohydrate restriction having more favorable impact on metabolic syndrome. So these are the at risk subjects and the type of diet given in the low carb was 45 grams of carb, 105 grams of protein, 98 grams of fat, and then there was the standard diet. And the atherogenic dyslipidemia at the beginning, and they did this improve, they showed this improvement in the uh, marker of APOB to A1 ratio. Again, it tells you about atherogenic particles and also particle distribution. So this showed a favorable effect by going with the extreme carbohydrate restriction. Actually, Dr. Volek and Steve Finney, they are uh, uh, pioneers in, in promoting this for diabetes reversal. Um, this was another RCT in JAMA, low glycemic load versus low fat. In again, our young population, as Dr. Rao mentioned, that we have a very young population who's progressing into metabolic imbalance. So this is, applies in that sense, obese young adults, low glycemic load versus low fat, 18 months, BMI 30 plus at the, at the beginning. And the low glycemic load gave better weight loss, better loss in body fat percentage compared to the low fat diet and better improvements in the HDL group, okay? So low carb improves cardiovascular risk factors better than low fat does. It's about time that we get out of the old conditioning of saying these things to people and change the way we give our advice. But everybody loves their carbs, right? So what to do? Should I have my carbs first? Should I have them last? What about fiber? What about the satisfaction I get from carbs? What is this whole grain uh, topic? So briefly, concept slides. I don't expect you to read this. I'll just tell you the summary. If you're going to want to have your carbs, this is a study done by an endocrinologist uh, who was in Mumbai. She's now moved back to New York, uh, published in 2019. They looked at the exact same food, changing the order. So when you take your carbohydrates first and then your rest of the meal, you have more glycemic variability, more unstable sugars. Whereas if you start with proteins and vegetables first and then take your carbs last, your post-meal glucose levels are more stable. What about fiber? New England Journal of Medicine, 2000, May 2000 paper, 50 grams of fiber. The standard recommendations are 20 to 30 grams of fiber. This is a paper looking at 50 grams of fiber, 25 from soluble, 25 from insoluble. It's a simple Google search to look for images of what does 25 grams of soluble fiber look like. We need to know what this is because nobody ever went to the weighing scale and measured fiber. We don't do that on a day-to-day -day basis. So telling people 25 grams of fiber is not usable information. So just get yourself familiar with what are the portion sizes so that you can actually do this. And it showed benefit in 24 hour glucose and insulin profiles, plus improved triglyceride, just adding fiber. What are carbohydrate cravings? It's a pure effect on the brain, the psychological feeling satisfied, the hedonic pathways, the dopamine pathways, the reward centers. That's why we all love and crave our carbs. There is a reason for it. So the more carbs you take, the more likely you are to crave them. Just knowing that, helping our patients with that awareness. And whole grain, just because it was a whole grain in the field where it was grown, doesn't mean that when you have a whole grain or a multi-grain kakra or a multi-grain bread, which melts in your mouth without chewing or without you cooking it yourself, that is no more a whole grain. It was a whole grain once upon a time. A whole grain needs to be cooked for 30 minutes and you need to chew it for it to get into your system. It cannot just go down as a melt in your mouth. That's not whole grain. So. This is just to summarize what this slide says. So I stopped inpatient medicine because I just could not feel connected to that work. I believe my purpose is to help people stay out of hospital. And when we used to do the inpatient rounds, I would see the diabetic diet or the cardiac diet and it would be loaded with carbohydrates. So the next time you're on rounds and you see what your patient is being served, which is a much higher ratio of highly processed carbohydrate, idli melts in your mouth and we praise it. The more it melts in my mouth, I say such a soft and fluffy idli. It has nothing to do with the whole grain, whole grain rice, which was harvested long back. It has been gone through so many steps, parboiling, grinding, soaking, fermenting, and then steaming. 
it's highly highly processed rice and it is high glycemic so this ratio needs to change bring the percentage down if you really love your idlis and you want to enjoy it with the family keep it but reduce the portion increase your healthy unprocessed fats could be the coconut chutney the ghee the mulga podi powder gun powder all these are saturated healthy fats unprocessed and your sambar needs to be full of dal full of proteins full of vegetables then it will be a beautiful tasty meal and you would have immediately reduced your metabolic risk from this meal what about salt this is a big one i spent a lot of time researching for this so let's see if we can condense the information giving salt to normotensive subjects about 80% of them do not see a change in blood pressure at all even in prehypertension 75% don't respond in people who have proper hypertension 55% of them are totally immune to the effects of salt on blood pressure and yet we are if we are blindly telling everybody reduce salt reduce salt reduce salt guess what can happen there are divergent bp responses to sodium restriction 1980 this paper these papers have not become popular because it was getting inconvenient everybody wanted to focus on saturated fat nobody wanted to focus on sugar or carbohydrates so they focused on saturated fat and they focused on salt okay and salt has gotten into so much trouble that now we have books written about salt okay to bring it back so this was a study done on OPD and IPD patients where cutting salt out gave 28% of the IPD patients their BP got worse, 17% outpatient. So it may not be the right advice for all your patients. Again, what happens with salt restriction? It's not the same thing to take a glass of water and put salt in and then say that the osmolality of this water has changed. The body is not so dumb. The body is not so stupid that if you put salt in your mouth, suddenly your blood pressure is going to go up. There are so many hormonal pathways to maintain normal body profiles. The body is always finding a state of homeostasis, so it has counter-regulatory hormones. Guess what happens when you start reducing salt? Aldosterone and sodium retention pathways will have to kick in because we need a certain amount of salt. What is the most abundant electrolyte in our blood? Happens to be sodium, right? So. Dietary restriction increases vascular resistance. This was a small study, 13 subjects, eight of them had borderline BP, double blind crossover. There was worsened insulin resistance in the low salt diet in the ones who had hypertension. Okay, we actually made insulin resistance worse in these people. These are expensive studies to do. These are like insulin clamps, you're measuring insulin responses hourly, it's very costly. It's very difficult to do these papers. 1989, New England Journal of Medicine, this was a fascinating paper. They took obese young teenagers and they were sodium sensitive. So when they were given sodium, their BP started to go up. So they had sodium sensitivity. They went through a 20 week weight loss program and then they became less sodium sensitive. Means after weight loss, when these same people were given salt, their BPs were not getting high. What does that tell us? That there is an intelligent hormonal mechanism that is adapting to your dietary salt. It is working to keep your blood pressure normal. So it goes backfires if you set up counter-regulatory aldosterone or hyperinsulinemia response. And cardiologists know all about hyperaldosteronism, right? So I don't need to say anything about why we don't want high aldosterone. So there is another thing which is just a sort of pop culture idea that there is a Korean paradox that they eat a lot of salt in these countries. So many countries have high sodium intake and yet lower cardiac rates. If salt was really that bad, we should have seen a, a clear signal in some way or form. In fact, even the Mediterranean heart healthy diet has many added ingredients that are soaked in brine. All these foods, capers, these fish, these olives, they're all sitting in salt water and they take it every day as a side dish. They have salty cheese soups and fish caught from the sea which obviously brings in some sodium so we are celebrating the mediterranean diet for its olive oil but we should also look at the salt this is a beautiful study 2014 new england journal they measured urinary sodium and followed these people for mortality and cardiovascular events it was a long-term follow-up one lakh people in 17 countries, 3.7 years of follow-up, the cohort is called PURE, and they basically watched what happens to these people over time in life, long term. And they saw that, considering the urinary sodium ranges 
for the people who had cardiac events and death versus did not. There was a safe range between three to six grams of sodium daily intake, which is about one teaspoon, half a teaspoon to one teaspoon of added salt per day. And that was the safe zone. If you were taking less than three grams of salt per day, they were showing up with negative cardiac re results. Higher than six grams of salt per day, negative cardiac outcomes. And this, this stayed as a sort of, it stayed st significant even after correcting for so many other confounding variables. This stood out as an outlier, and it was so many countries, including India, were in this study. What about protein? Remission of prediabetes, giving them high protein diet. Now, high protein here is 112 grams of protein a day compared to high carb. Even in their uh, carbohydrate group, they still got 56 grams of protein in this group. Okay, and what did they see with this that when you were in the high protein group, you had better insulin sensitivity, cardiac risk factors went down, cytokines, oxidative stress went down, lean body mass went up compared to high carb. And guess what we also know, the other extreme is severe malnutrition directly correlates to increased risk of cardiac death in the long term. So you might be exposed to malnutrition in childhood or famine in childhood and you have higher cardiac outcomes in later life. And I, I think, and we've done this, we've measured our patient's protein intake every day in our clinic. It's something we assess on our clients every single day. And on day one, when they come in and we do their diet calculations, most of my patients who are predominantly veg, their daily protein intake is 10 to 30. So we are not even reaching the protein requirements which were in the high carb group in the, in the study. Okay, so I think that India has gone from suffering from famine and energy or calorie malnutrition in some parts of the country we have given back nutrition in the form of carbohydrates think about what we do when we have donations for the underprivileged the majority of what we give them is rice and biscuits we are giving them carbohydrates and we are not giving them enough protein even in well-to-do families they are still sitting at 10 to 30 grams of protein a day no matter whether they're affluent or not. So we have a severe problem of protein malnutrition in this country, which is a huge epidemic, which is driving a lot of our metabolic imbalance, driving our sarcopenia and muscle loss. Coming to muscle. What about exercise? This is, again, we all like proof, even though common sense tells you exercise is good for you. We have become so used to sitting in chairs for 10 hours a day that we need proof that exercise will help. So, okay. Pediatric Journal 2014, looking at aerobic versus or cardio exit training versus resistance training versus both together. This was an RCT and they checked body fat percent on MRI, zero months and six months. There was greater body fat reduction in the cardio group uh, compared to control and greater body fat reduction in the strength training group compared to control. And the combination was believed to be more beneficial, although they weren't able to show that in the study, but there were some reasons why the authors felt that the combo would be better. Here's another paper in 2019, plus one, an excellent paper, RCT, checking aerobic exercise, which is cardio exercise, compared to strength training, which is weights and body weight, actually using dumbbells or your own body weight, resistance training versus the combination. And these were high-risk people, adults with metabolic syndrome, hypertension, obesity, sedentary people, randomized to eight weeks of three times a week. Either they got aerobic, one group, one group got resistance, the third group group got combination cardio plus strength training. And they found improvements in the combined group. The best outcome was with combo exercise in terms of blood pressure, cardiorespiratory fitness, obvious strength, and improved lean body mass. So across age groups, we need to get our patients to invest in combined. I think a lot of what we do is every time someone gets a diagnosis of a cardiac issue or diabetes, they're all willing to go for walks. We're very willing to go for walks. We're very willing to sign up for yoga. We need to make sure that we also get them to do their strength training. They have to do resistance training to get their muscle mass to increase. What is HIIT? We need to know about this because it's very popular nowadays. It is short bursts of vigorous activity that gets your heart rate up and then you have rest or low intensity exercise in between. So it might be 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, very intense and then rest and these workouts can be shorter you'll see on youtube there'll be like seven to ten minute hiit workouts so this was a paper that looked that showed that even hiit when used with overweight or obese patients 
can help with our metabolic profile that we are looking at, whether it's insulin or blood pressure or body composition. And that was being compared to continuous workout where it's a nonstop same intensity versus this sort of intense and then rest and intense and then rest. It also works. And we need to talk about sedentariness because we know that the diabetes prevention program trial, which was published in 2002, 20 years ago, it was proven to the world by the DPP study that lifestyle change is more powerful than metformin at preventing diabetes in people with prediabetes. This was proven, okay? And that was big before the A1C of 6.5. Magically, we don't have studies after the A1C becomes 6.5 comparing lifestyle to drugs. And I won't have to explain why, but this study included 150 minutes of exercise per week, which you can say is 30 minutes of exercise five days a week. But if you're spending the remaining 23 and a half hours of the day, 23 and a half hours of the day, doing nothing but sitting in one place, which is called sedentary, you still have increased risk. So it's not only about 150 minutes of dedicated exercise. There's also something called daily activity. So there are studies now looking at that alternating bouts of sitting and standing. This was done. The target population you can see here on the right was overweight, obese, sedentary office workers, our high risk population for cardiometabolic syndrome. What they were told to do is every 30 minutes, instead of sitting for the office work, raise the adjustable table and stand and do your office work. That's it. And every 30 minutes, they had to keep shifting the desk height and stand work and then sit and work 30 minutes and they found improvements in postprandial glycemia. Then there was a study looking at the uh, breaks in sedentary time where they, look, where they made the patient wear an accelerometer on the trunk and measured ex sedentary time. And even if the amount of hours of sedentary time were same in both groups, the group that had X number of hours of sedentary behavior with breaks where it wasn't eight hours of nonstop sitting, but they were getting up and doing something versus eight hours of just sitting in one place. The breaks in being sedentary helped. So it makes sense to tell our people to get up and go walk around every 30 minutes. Just get up and move around and do something. And we think about our children sitting in schools, lecture, 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 lecture. They need to be allowed to get up and move their bodies and not have them be locked down in desks in school. Okay, so we need to help do this combination exercise. And yes, I'm an endocrinologist speaking to a cardiology audience today, but guess what? There are so many cardiologists now talking about lifestyle change and literally giving solutions of how to make this difference in your clients and in your own life. And these people are doing a lot of work. Uh, these are just a few names that I read up and I follow their work and I've learned a lot from them. And if you're very interested in the controversy 50 years ago was when this big professional clash happened between these two people. It was a major, major uh, uh, sort of controversy, which is coming up to surface now. These are some of the books that I've read uh, over the last 15 years and continue to do so. Uh, all interesting books about calories, about just food in general, weight gain, low carb performance for exercise. Again, this is by an endocrinologist. This book is by a cardiologist. This lady is an investigative journalist and she's exposed the sort of saturated fat problem to us that it was wrong. This is again conventional, challenging conventional nutrition, the book on salt, the book on healthy fats, a book by an endocrinologist on why are we always hungry. This whole book is about insulin. Longevity, of course, if we're trying to prevent cardiac events, we are very much interested in longevity. It's the same two sides of the same coin. And uh, Obesity Code by Jason Fung, Fantastic book. I learned more about insulin physiology from this book than I learned in my fellowship. And that's just because that's the way we're taught. We're taught to focus on disease and not physiology. This is a beautiful book released last year, Why We Get Sick. Another book I didn't get time today to cover fasting and intermittent fasting, but there's a whole idea of time restricted eating. This is a brand new book that has come purely on uric acid. And due to interest of time, I had to remove some slides, but the idea of uric acid tying into cardiac uh, risk and it comes purely from sugar and insulin resistance and not from purine rich vegetables and pulses and lentils so please don't get your audience to stop there is no evidence that eating purine rich vegetables causes uric acid events so please let them have their healthy vegetables pulses and beans 
and this is how you can reach me and i'm going to now stop thank you excellent talk roshni thank wonderful, you wonderful as expected and it you covered virtually everything so if we look at today's uh, flow of event from 